All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. As you like it, Act 2, Scene 7. And one of Shakespeare's most quoted lines, but some men and women have proved to be more than mere players, ranking amongst the greats of Shakespearean theatre and film. Here, we are meeting some of the very best from over the years, sharing their insights into the all-time great performances. I was trying to sell realism in Shakespeare. I believed in it with my whole soul. We'll hear about the challenges that come with tackling Shakespeare's biggest characters. I didn't know that I would be the first black person ever to have played an English king at the RSC. And get their perspectives on why his plays still remain so relevant. The relevance of Shakespeare, it's, it's great art. We start with a truly fabulous foursome. All made dames for their services to acting. Maggie Smith, Eileen Atkins, Joan Plywright and Judi Dench, all friends for decades. And we join them here talking about one of Shakespeare's toughest female roles and one that gets second billing in Antony and Cleopatra. I'm not going to talk about Cleopatra. <laughs> right. Judy, you start. You? Uh oh. Why? I nobody ha <laughs> I'm in the clear with this one. <gasps> you bang on. What do you mean I you're in the clear? <laughs> well, I've turned no, it down no. four times because I thought I wasn't good looking enough. That's the end of my story of Cleopatra. And I what do we have... meant to say about that? What what what, you, what are we meant to say to that? <laughs> You're meant to say, oh, Eileen, how, what how a fool you! No, I, 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 not good looking. That's a silly word. I don't know. No, I didn't have the courage. Uh, there you are. I didn't have. The no, courage. neither did I. That's why I did it in Canada. Yes, you did it though. But mm. you did it. Yes. Yes, I, I did. didn't have the courage. Oh. I was asked by Jonathan Miller to do it. I just said I couldn't possibly do it at the National, because in my own mind, I wouldn't be first choice. Half of them will say, oh, my God, you know, she shouldn't be playing Cleopatra. Cleopatra's supposed to be a great beauty. So that's the first stumbling block, isn't it? But you said a marvellous thing, Judy, when you <coughs> were asked to do Cleopatra. Do you really want... Now, you go on with it. <laughs> she forgot. I can't remember what I... I just remember people laughing openly. Uh, apropos of what you said. When I said I was going to play and it was announced, people laughed openly at me. <laughs> but you said to... Peter Hall, was it, of the charge? <clears throat> do you really want... Do you want me to say it? A dwarf. Yes, I do. A menopausal do dwarf. Say. That's yes. it. Was. It's very funny. Are you sure you want a menopausal dwarf to play this part? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely true. They, That's you, what she well, was. Well, That's well. what she was, quite. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I played it's it. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the fellow? Oh, I feared to come. Go to, go to. Come hither, sir. Good Majesty, Herod of Jury dare not look upon you, but when you are well pleased. That Herod's head I'll have. But how, when Antony is gone, through whom I might command it? There's gold for thee. They assume, what well, I'm talking about critics, that we all think we're the, the king's knees, <laughs> the bee's knees, um, and we'll take on these parts. They don't re realize that we're shaking inside, right? That's absolutely yeah, true, because that's two of us didn't have any courage at all and yeah. not doing it. There's Maggie nervously doing it in another country, and Judy shakingly did it. Tony Hopkins, on the top of the monument, he used to say, I'm going now for a nice lie down while you do act five. <laughs> I've never not known an Anthony complain, because I think they find out that really it's Cleopatra's evening rather no, more than Antony's. I think Cleopatra is a better part oh. than Antony. And I think the men never know until they're in the middle of doing it. Oh, I see. I know Alan Bates told me that. He he's said, halfway through, I realised. That's because he wanted to play Cleopatra. <laughs> there is something of that in it, absolutely. You can't win. Famously, Cleopatra was a great beauty, 
something many actresses have found intimidating, but not the great Edith Evans, who took on the role in 1946, the same year she was made a Dane. You have never been the conventionally accepted beautiful woman. No, no, I've never been what was called a pretty girl. I think you're beautiful, actually. Well, you see, the extraordinary thing is that I've got a face that paints well. That paints well? That paints well. <laughs> you know, the, the makeups can always make me, because I was talking the other day when we came to interview me, and I was saying, I've never been what you call a pretty girl, but I must have had something, you <laughs> see. And she said, well, when I saw you play in Daphne and Laureola, I thought you were the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. But I had to play a beautiful woman. And if I've got to play a beautiful woman, I can be beautiful. You played Cleopatra, of course, didn't you? Yes, I wasn't very good. <laughs> no, not very good. Why? But, uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 it wasn't what I call one of my good ones. No. <laughs> I wasn't very pleased with it. But if you feel <clears throat> beautiful inside, and you've got a face that I say takes the paint well, you know, you can suggest beauty. And you can do it if you're an ordinary woman too. Really? You any don't woman have to be an any woman can do it if she just takes a little bit of trouble with herself and has a lovely feeling inside and bees beautiful. You've got to be beautiful. Now an acting masterclass from another dame, Peggy Ashcroft, here in rehearsals back when she played Cleopatra for BBC Radio. Antonia's dead. If thou say so, villain, thou killest thy mistress. But well and free, if thou so yield him, there is gold, and here my bluest vein to kiss, a hand that kings have trembled, and, damn, a hand that kings have lipped and trembled, kissing. Thirty years before that, Peggy Ashcroft had found herself in the enviable position of playing Juliet to not one, but two Romeos, the part switching on alternate nights between Laurence Olivier and the man also directing the play, John Gielgud. For decades, Gielgud and Olivier were associated with Shakespeare more than any others, and their different styles highlighted all the complexities of his plays and the different ways they could be tackled. And I remember when I first worked with Laurence Olivier in Romeo and Juliet, and we alternated the parts of Mercutio and Romeo, and I was directing. And I bullied him a great deal about his verse speaking, which he admitted himself he wasn't happy about. I was rather showy about mine and fancied myself very much as a verse speaker, and I think became very mannered in consequence. But uh, I was so jealous because when he played Romeo, he used tremendous energy, but he knew just how to cope with it, select it. And also, when he did things which I tried to do in the same part, I remember Ralph Richardson, who I had made great friends with, in, in, meanwhile, saying to me, but you see, when Larry leans against the balcony, the whole balcony scene is, the way he leans against the balcony, looks up, is the whole scene immediately, because he has this wonderful plastique, which is absolutely unselfconscious, like a lithe young panther or something. And I had been draping myself around the stage for weeks, <laughs> thinking of myself very romantic as Romeo. I was rather baffled and dismayed to find I couldn't make the same effect at all. I was fighting a cause when I was playing Romeo, because, uh, Understand, I've admired John Gilgood all my life com with complete devotion. I've never thought of myself as quite the same actor as he is. It's the same sort of actor. I've, I've always thought that we were the reverses of the same coin, perhaps. I've seen, uh, as if you had a coin, <laughs> I'd seen the top half John, all spiritual, all spirituality, all beauty, all abstract things, and myself, all earth, <laughs> blood. Earth. Everything to do with Earth. Humanity, the, if you like, the baser part of humanity. I suppose I must have sensed a sort of possible rivalry between us that might last all our lives. I don't know, but I suppose it made me go for the other. Whatever it was that he had might have done that. That might have happened that way. But uh, when I was playing Romeo, I was uh, carrying a torch. I, I, I was trying to sell realism in Shakespeare. I believed in it with my whole soul. And I believed that Johnny 
was not doing that enough. I thought that he was uh, paying attention to the exclusion of the earth to all music, all lyricism. And uh, I was for the other side of the coin. Olivier and Gilgood only ever appeared in the same film together once, in Olivier's 1955 film version of Richard III. Brother! Good day. What means this armed guard that waits upon your grace? His Majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. And that's me, Lord. That fault is none of yours. Also appearing in that production, another great Shakespearean and good friend of Larry and Johnny, enter Sir Ralph Richardson. Now, my lord, what shall we do if we perceive that the Lord Hastings will not yield to our complots? Chop off his head, man. I'd love to ask you about your two great friends, Sir Lawrence Olivier and Sir John Gielgud. I was going to ask, how, how do, do their characters relate to their performances, do you think? Well... Lawrence is a very bold, very daring man. In his own life, in his own personal life. And he's able to, to produce an excitement on the stage, which is very rare. Tremendous sense of danger. Yes. And he's very, very daring in his characterizations. And this uh, is one thing. Now, Johnny Gilgood, if we were to compare them, is, I would say, and I think that he'll agree, personally rather a timid man. I mean, he's not timid in his work, but he doesn't like, he said, no, I've never learned to swim, for instance for instance, and uh, he, he, physically he's he, he, different in that way. Although his courage and his work is fantastic. When he, uh, I was with him at the Old Vic when he, when he played uh, King Lear for the first time. And he found at the first rehearsal, that it, first dress rehearsal, that it wasn't working very well. He changed the whole thing for the next rehearsal. Now that's a boldness, an interior boldness, which few people could dream of. These titans of Shakespeare inspired many generations, not least a future actor and director whose first encounter with the Bard was with two records he came across at school, one by Olivier and the other by Gielgud. And these records were your introduction to Shakespeare? They were, yes, they were. Absolutely. First thing you'd ever heard? Yes, I, I, I'd really... Um, these two titans were the people who really introduced me to the sort of clarion call, the music of this particular language. In both cases, it was very muscular, it was very direct. It, even Gilgood, although people accused him of the opposite, was very grounded, and he, they made you understand it. And so, uh, And the other thing, in fact, they really made me understand was that I didn't have to understand all of it, particularly with Gielgud, his gift in understanding it himself, somehow he gave me permission to have just an intuited experience of the language so that I began to understand I don't have to understand everything precisely, but the emotional shape of it, I'm, I'm feeling, and that in itself is a bit of a wonder because for the first time I understood poetry and Shakespeare in particular operating on my senses as if it were music, i.e. it did something, in fact, beyond words, although that was the launch pad. And so you'd have listened to these at home, in the bedroom, Absolutely. studied them. You borrowed these LPs from school? I, well, you? I did borrow them, although they're still in my possession, so I suppose the borrowing is not exactly, is not precisely... Fact, do we have them here? Yes, yeah. So these are... Circa, I suppose, I can tell you this, John, that, that uh, Circa, um, because 1977, the, the, the Mebue Comprehensive School 
English store cupboard had these, and I borrowed them for a mere 45 years. Uh, the, the school <laughs> doesn't exist anymore, so I suppose they don't have a home to go to. But you but are fessing up finally. Uh, I'm you? fessing up. If the Berkshire County Council wish to uh, retain these and, and give them to some other Shakespeare-starved youngster, I'm very pleased to, to hand them back. But uh, You know, the thing that strikes me is they yeah. are in fantastic nick. You've obviously looked after them very well. I this also looked, suggests yeah. that they hadn't been borrowed or listened to or used before. This, uh, your detect, your you Sherlock Holmes, your Sherlock Holmes mind is, is correct I was, I was very I read the sleeve notes uh, copiously and uh, and then these two titles became rather important to me in the end Hamlet yes. and Henry V so. did you study the record did you learn the speeches did you uh, well I sort of I, I, I speak I, along, I speak along. I copied them a bit so I did a bit of uh, um, you know if you all oh, that is too too solid flesh would melt for and resolve it I'll to watch you <laughs> Is a bad version of it. Or Gielgud doing his... Uh, um, he does a speech of Hotspur because My liege, I didn't deny no prisoners, but I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, etc. That was, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't get it out of your system, really. I bet if we overlaid that alongside the original, it would be ah. very, very hard to tell the difference. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, you have been compared to Olivier throughout your career, haven't you? Uh, well, yes, and, and partly because uh, he 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 he, uh, he was a role model. He, exactly. Well, he was the inspiration. An actor, acting and directing uh, films of Shakespeare, and and so uh, yes, anybody who trod the same path was going to be compared, whether it was a worthy comparison or not. But he was certainly an inspiration. Yeah, some other people may have been compared, but yeah, I mean, you really took the mantle, didn't you? I mean, it was for a while. It was the new Olivier. Was that? Did it feel like a burden, or was it flattery? Uh, I think I was too young. To to see it as flattery, I think it was more of a burden. I think it annoyed more people than than, than and so that gave you a certain kind of aggravation. So uh, I think expectations a tough thing, you know. So if you're expected to be the next big thing, in a way, I'm proud that I've sort of found my faltering, stumbly way to this point. When I've seen other people who've had those great expectations laid on them early doors, and I've seen people, and I've worked with people who feel the weight of it and if one thing I'm sort of proud of is that I'm not always very well but I've managed to sort of keep going and you know there's a, 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 line, a line in a movie I wrote a long time ago in the bleak midwinter a black and white comedy about about a man trying to put on Hamlet uh, who in the end <laughs> couldn't explain how you got on in life much better than saying well you fall down you get up you fall down you get up <laughs> it's like the Beckett line isn't it which is uh, fail fail again fail better and um, I guess I've tried to uh, you know do something like that. That Olivier and Gilgood were inspiring in their own separate ways was beyond doubt. But how they hit those heights and what elevates an actor above others can be unknowable, even to the person themselves. There's a great story of uh, Olivier doing Othello, who's, um, you know, quite brilliant in the role on, on stage. One night he is just flying, absolutely flying. His performance is so extraordinary, the rest of the cast start gathering in the, in the wings to watch. And, um, but every time he comes off stage, he just won't look at anyone. He just charges past them, don't look at me, you know, don't speak to me. And uh, he just charges past them and waits, and then he goes back on again, and he's absolutely astounding. And then the end comes, and the audience goes mad because they've seen one of the greatest performances ever. And the, and the bow, and he rushes, he charges off stage and goes into his dressing room, closes the door and locks the door. And all the cast are looking at him, oh, God, what's wrong with Larry? You know, why, what's happened? So um, they go up to his, I don't know, knocks on his door, and uh, said, Larry, are, are you okay? Said, yeah, I'm fine. Said, Larry, are you okay? You know, what, what is it? What's the matter? You were, we just have to say you were absolutely astounding tonight. It was amazing. But what's the matter? Why? He said, I know, I know. I just don't know why. I don't know why I was so brilliant. I don't know where that performance came from. And knowing that he would never find it again. And I think that was why he was so, so you know, intense and emotional about it because he knew that it was once in a lifetime and he'll never find that, that, those moments again. And Shakespeare can do that to you. I, I think it's true that uh, to say of this performance of Larry's as Othello, that it was one of the real uh, marks 
of the theatre that will be always remembered. I mean, like Keane's first performance of Shylock. It was a performance that aroused such strong feelings yes. in the audiences who saw it that people were either absolutely bowled over by it or disliked it very much. And this, in some ways, I think, is the greatest compliment that an actor may have. I reject his, his interpretation. While I can't help but admiring the extraordinary compelling personality and the, the brilliant work he has done. Maggie Smith played Desdemona in Othello opposite Olivier, on stage and in the 1965 film. Her performance earned her a first Oscar nomination, but two years later, she still seemed surprised at Olivier's original decision to cast her. At the beginning, it was very hard. The, you know, the first play was Othello, which absolutely terrified me because it was extraordinary casting. And always, Sir Lawrence has... I mean, he has... He's got an extraordinary sort of aura around his name, you know. I found I was very nervous of him. It's very unfair on Sir Lawrence, but it's bound to happen. You, know, you, you are in awe of him very much. Of course, Desdemona is a very difficult part to play because she's very innocent and very virtuous, and by today's values, these are very boring mm. virtues. Did you find this? John Dexter, the director, sort of did point out that she has no mother and obviously had coped with the household in Venice and sort of had run the affairs fairly efficiently. So she doesn't necessarily have to be that very weak and withdrawn and sad, quiet creature who just sits around and sings a lot, you know. And also, of course, she defies her father to the extent... Exactly, that... you know, she has a mind of her own, very much so, and defies her father in the Senate and... Now, at the National Theatre, you've played nine parts. What's your favourite part, is really what? I suppose the most satisfying Rarely was Desdemona, because it was one of the most difficult and one that, you know, everybody thought was a mistake and was, you know, impossible. And I find it wasn't satisfying at the beginning, that I would agree. It's something that I, I think I have managed to work on and, and make better. And, of course, it's one of your first, or one of your few tragic roles in the theatre. Well, it was really my very first, I suppose. And also the fact that it was Shakespeare, which is rather difficult for somebody who plays like comedy. Olivier's Othello is considered very much of its time and not acceptable now. But as two leading actors of today testified in 2018, the challenges that surrounded the role of Othello do still exist and extend into other plays too. I haven't worked in England for 10 years. That's really quite extraordinary. I was a novelty. I was this classically trained black actor with a received pronunciation voice, a classical voice, and there just weren't any parts for me. We were told audiences won't go and see a production with a black leading actor. Critics would slam a production with a black leading actor. When the Royal Shakespeare Company came to me after drama school and wanted me to play Henry VI. I knew what the significance of that was, but I didn't know that I would be the first black person ever to have played an English king at the RSC. I spent weeks defending that piece of casting on the phone, on my lunch break, while we were rehearsing, because an Oxford Don had said, we open ourselves to ridicule if we allow black people to play these kind of parts. It sort of blew up in the press and I became a mouthpiece for colorblind casting. I can remember when I played Othello, it was the Independence broadsheet newspaper ran this piece saying, why is this happening? Who is this David Harewood? Surely this should go to Brian Cox. But despite those examples of resistance, Shakespeare seems to be irresistible to those looking to break new boundaries in drama. I've come to meet the actor Adjoa Ando, or as some of you may know her, Bridgerton's Lady Danbury. 
your grace. Welcome to my den of iniquity. When you were involved with the Globe production of Richard II, all women cast, all people of colour, mm. were you saying something about reclaiming a, te a text or power? Well, or what? Uh, no, absolutely. I wanted to use women whose antecedents had come from somewhere in the globe that this country had gone and done unto. Maybe I'm not a very um, careful reader, Richard II, but you saw the critiques of British power. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, back in Shakespeare's day, the, you know, the women would have been played by men and boys. Exactly. And so you really are moving there from women being literally not, not part of the action. Yeah to, you know, flip that yeah. entirely. I'm a black woman and I love Shakespeare. Yeah. So I want to do Shakespeare yes. and I want to go, yeah. come, on, come on, come on, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, so yeah. it's, it's not even about an academic, oh, let's just switch it up. It's like, yeah. no, I want to do yeah. it. Yeah. I'm yeah. an actor. Yeah. It's a great part. In 1930, Paul Robeson became the first black actor to play Othello on the London stage in the 20th century drawing headlines and huge acclaim, and enjoying a love affair with his Desdemona, Peggy Ashcroft. Nearly 30 years later, he took on the role again in Stratford-upon-Avon to mark the 100th season of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, then called the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre. Does playing Othello mean something more to you, merely than playing a part in Shakespeare? Well, I should say so. Somewhere it seems to me that Shakespeare, uh, the genius that he was, seemed to foreshadow and understand many of the problems that have since arisen in our world, perhaps were present then. First, I would say that here is a part which has dignity for the Negro actor. Often we don't get those opportunities. And I would say that my people will be very proud of, 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 of my or any other Negro actor appearing in such, in such a part. I think also there, that to me Othello is one of a different culture. Uh, Shakespeare insists that he's African. Uh, some argue whether he's he, the, the, the word black and, uh, and the fact that he's from Africa is very clear to me. Mm. And that Shakespeare posed this problem of a, say, black man in a white society uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the role that he's playing. And, uh, and Shakespeare gave Othello such dignity. He killed not from, as he said, not from, not from hate, but from honor, from a sense of his own human dignity. Yes. And to me, to my mind, there could be no, 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 no greater uh, character to play than one like that. I seem to remember reading when you came over in 1930 that you made a special study of uh, English speech for playing Othello. Have you done the same this time? Well, I, well sort of once. Uh, let's go back to 1930, which was the very definite time. Where, of course, in America, as I say, we were, I uh, had just come over from America, and we like to say pass and chance and uh, and do for the morning do, and uh, and I happened to pick up an old script uh, of uh, of Shakespeare, and the do was very clear. It was D I E W, and and the, and the, it was not chance. C H A U N C E. So it was do like in lieu of, and uh, and chance and dance. It's very very Shakespearean, way. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one terrible d difficult sound was was my, almost at the beginning of the play, my services, which I have done the seniory, my services, services. I would say my services, my services. I had to work on that very hard. <laughs> <laughs> but later I took some special work at the University of London, and also in my university days I majored in English, and I have records from the earliest time, of, from the time of Anglo-Saxons, as a matter of fact, mm. through Chaucer. And, uh, I've, and of course since I worked on my songs with Roger Quilter, and I would have to use the role. I couldn't walk out here and s say, drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge with mine. It's got to be very, drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge with mine. Or leave a kiss within the cup. You see what I mean? Yes, <laughs> yes. I do. We're looking forward to tomorrow night. Thank well, you very thanks much. Thanks so much for coming. Another problematic character in the Shakespeare canon is Shylock from The Merchant of Venice. It's a part that has always divided critics over the question of whether the role explores anti-Semitism or is just anti-Semitic. Hugely challenging for an actor then, but one who willingly took it on and drew considerable praise for their portrayal was Al Pacino in Michael Radford's 2004 film version. Do you feel that The Merchant of Venice is describing anti-Semitism, 
or expressing it? Well, a little of both, I would say. I can see the anti-Semitism there, and so I, I, I have to deal with that. But for instance, if you hear just the word infidel, right, that you hear it in the, uh, in, in, in the play, it has a different ring to it today for us. It's just a word we all understand and know, but at the same time, it, it has a different reaction. I see less uh, anti-Semitism in the, in the piece and more of uh, understanding of different factions. And what's his reason? I am a Jew! Hat that a Jew eyes? Hat that a Jew hands? Warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If I would have done the play, I don't know what the performance would have been like. It would have had to have been different. How different, uh, is, it's hard to say, but it would have been different. I'd have taken certain chances. Right. Whereas in the movies, I'm, I'm sort of um, really in the hands of the director for the most part, and I'm trying to just go with what's happening at the time, go with what's going to get me through the movie, and make, um, make a choice and stick with it. Bid me tear the bond. When it is paid, according to the terms. When you see uh, your performance on film, do you think there are things that you would like to change? That's a huge question, because what it really says is that it's, the, it's really the difference, but the very, the nuanced difference between film acting and stage acting. Uh, I, as a, as, as a stage actor first, because that's what I did first, I, I find that I would, I, I miss not doing something on stage, even though in a film performance, because we're, we're always working within the frame of film, so yeah. it's much more subtle. I mean, it's just not, it's a different ball game, let's face it. It's just different. And so you approach a role differently. First of all, you don't learn the whole role. Yes. You don't have to do the whole role every day. You're out there, you may yeah. be just doing part of a scene yes. that day. So you, your, your, your psyche attacks it or deals with it differently. And so I wanted to ask you, really, a, if you regretted not being able to play some of those great Shakespearean roles, yeah. and secondly, um, when yeah. are we going to see you on stage? I regret not having done Hamlet. I don't think I would have done it very well, but the point is, I still wish I'd, I'd have done it. A whole host of actors have shared Pacino's desire to tackle Hamlet, reflecting the fact that the Great Dane's revenge tragedy is Shakespeare's most performed and most pondered over play. And it contains, of course, the most famous line in all theatre, which throws up a whole set of challenges and opportunities. You walk on stage and you know that in about 10 minutes, here it comes, to be or not to be, that is the question. And everyone knows that, and everyone's saying it with you, and you've got to do it an entirely original, new and fresh way. It's totally impossible, but you have to do it. You have to do it. And then you've got about five of those coming up, the big hurdles, and the critics are sitting back saying, now, what is Mr. Briars going to do with this? Ho, ho, ho. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of trouble, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartaches and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. But in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. The soliloquies were not my favorite speeches in the play. I preferred the extraordinary speech about life. What a, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet, to me, 
What is this quintessence of dust? To me, that says it all. Christopher Plummer played the lead role alongside Michael Caine's Horatio in 1964's Hamlet at Elsinore, and his choice of quote was also the pick of another great Shakespearean. Richard Burton's years with Elizabeth Taylor saw him splashed across the world's front pages, but here there is no Hollywood glamour, just a man who is very much off the stage. I suppose Hamlet is the great untouchable part of all time, but would you like to give us your favourite bit of the part? If there's any speech in Hamlet, I suppose that I would like to repeat, though Hamlet is so familiar to me now because I've played it so often as to become almost contemptuous. Uh, it is the speech, uh, the prose speech, oddly enough, uh, if I can remember it. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, seems to me no other thing but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable, in apprehension, how like an angel, in movement, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence? of dust. Now I have an idea that probably I got a few words wrong in that, but that's where familiarity breeds contempt. From an acting point of view, it's you get given these words that are a little bit magical. And at first they're a bit difficult because they're 400 years old and they need a bit of unlocking and they don't necessarily immediately sit in your mouth they don't they, there's a bit of translation that you have to go through um there's a bit of work about it and that's true from an audience's perspective as well but there's something about those words that when you're kind of on the inside of them and when you're in charge of them and when it feels like for a second you've got the wheel and you're driving them rather than them driving you. There's something slightly transcendental about them. One of the things that we did, and this is quite a niche sort of, uh, th this meant quite a lot for me. I don't, know, I don't know if an audience would even have been aware of it most of the time, but there are two versions of Hamlet. There's the folio version of Hamlet and there's the the, what is known as the bad quarto version of Hamlet. The bad quarto was the was the the, uh, the the sort of pamphlet version that was published much earlier. The first version of Hamlet that was ever put through a printing press, which people think was assembled by a bunch of the actors who were in it. It's and therefore it's it seems to be quite poorly remembered. Uh, some of the famous lines are not there, and the structure of the play is rather different. So we were quite we we quite freely borrowed some of that structure so to be or not to be we moved around um uh, it's not the the way that it usually is received which actually i i think is better to be or not to be that is the question Well, it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. At, at each moment, you don't, you there isn't an inevitability to how this is going to end, and Hamlet might decide to just whip out his dagger and kill Claudius, and the whole thing would end very differently. We took the interval in the theatre. We took the interval in the middle of a speech. Um, so uh, Patrick Stewart as Claudius was praying at the front of the stage and I, I came in and saw him wasn't expecting to see him, there he is um, 
and I realised I could do it right now, and I uh, now might I do it, Pat. Now he's a praying. I take a dagger out and I go to stab him, and the lights went out, and that was the interval. And now I'll do it. Uh, just we we're trying to find ways of undermining the audience's expectations. If you think you know this play, it's probably the most famous play in history. You probably think you know how it ends. And yes, it probably will end that way, but if we can make you doubt that along the way, then we will do everything we can to, uh, to make you think that it's just going to go a different way, that this time it might, they might not all die at the end. Somehow everyone might live happily ever after. That crucial scene and Hamlet's indecision has been examined ever since the play was first performed. Exploring the same question here, actors Orson Welles, Peter O'Toole and Ernest Milton in a fascinating discussion chaired by the BBC's Hugh Weldon. Why, uh, why in the end, why didn't, you know, when all said and done, uh, why didn't Hamlet kill Claudius? And if there would be no play. Exactly. Because there I were five so. acts to go. <laughs> And, and Shakespeare inherited a revenge melodrama. That's right. Into which he he placed some of the greatest living stuff that man has ever made. Language. Language and everything else. Spirit, fire, everything. Marvelous. But there were five acts to go, and old Claudius couldn't be killed until the last act. Yeah. Not quite. Also, I think quite that. that. We, we, yes. talked about, <laughs> we talked about that earlier yeah. on, about the divinity that Hedges King. Yes, and all that. Also, I think that there is, in the, basically, in Hamlet, a moral retractation from murder. Precisely, this is right. No, this is not true. I don't agree, Ernest. You get no. rid of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern without with, a, with a, with a oh, smile. Yes, but you've done that by the time you've gone over the edge. <laughs> if we agree that he's gone over the edge. What about Polonius? Right by then, I think he has What about Polonius? Well, Polonius was an accident. He, oh, he, he must have thought he yes, was the king. Yes, yes, you're right. And he does. Suppose it had been a field. He thinks that. Uh, Could have been anybody, but. He thinks Polonius is the king. Suppose it had been Horatius. But he was obsessed with the king, and he saw. Yes. He just left the king. king anyway. yeah. Just he know the king isn't there. He's just been the king is ah, on the point yes, uh, saying, you know, my offence is right. Ernest. He thinks the man behind the tapestry is the king. I think he, he does. Well, why can't he think that? He's just left him at prayer. I don't know, but he just feels he's gone to ruin. But he's found. He's just left him at prayer. Yeah. Your Hamlet does. I don't think uh, I another think Hamlet need. I think he thinks it's the king. Well, sure. I think he's perfectly it capable depends of on which murder. Text what move. he is not capable of in is some performing the no leading prayer, role see. in a in a revenge tragedy. Well, I use the text to hang. You use the prayer, scene. Ah. <laughs> yes. And then you kill the king in the closet. We will. Having left the king, we weeing <laughs> in the hill. <laughs> the time we is do. out of joint, oh cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. That me is the thing. <laughs> he doesn't want to have to play this role. No, he doesn't. He, no, well, is, he, he is, he is drafted into I, I, a role that he doesn't I want to play. play. But I seem to be just saying what Ernest Milton said. That's it. But you're saying, you're saying what Ernest Milton said, but he doesn't want to. No, no, he's a reluctant to make Precisely. It. But not that he has some particular hatred of murder. He does murder. We see him murder. Oh, yes, but I think that comes out of the subsequent hysteria. To me, the first point about Hamlet is that he's a genius. Not that he's a prince. Not that he's a man. He's simply the, the great figure in dramatic literature who is a man of genius. A decade after that chat, Peter O'Toole was talking to Michael Parkinson and again discussing Hamlet. I went up to do the to be or not to be from the bowels one night and uh, I was to being or not to being and I could hear slight titters. <laughs> And it was an afternoon performance. I thought, what are they laughing at? <laughs> and, of course, when you do that soliloquy, everybody knows it, so they all join in anyway. <laughs> it's like an old song. <laughs> should, should, lower, like, should lower a song sheet. <laughs> all together, though. All together. <laughs> I, but I'm not used to too many titters. And by this time, I, I was feeling much better with the way things were going. And uh, I, I don't know, I did some fine gesture, and I, of course I was wearing my bloody glasses. Because <laughs> I'd been down below with the stagehands picking out winners. <laughs> and I just sort of trudged through as far as I could and thought, how do I get rid of these? And I was wearing horn rims, how do I get, <laughs> how do I get rid of these? And the only thing I could do was to sling them at Ophelia. <laughs> There'd be no more marriage if I said, vroom! <laughs> And poor Rosie Harry's got a pair of horn rims slung at her. <laughs> Cut from the same cloth as the 70s rabble rousers is Anthony Hopkins. 
who was inspired to join the acting profession by Richard Burton, them both having come from the Welsh town of Port Talbot. In 1973, he walked out midway through a National Theatre production of Macbeth that he was starring in, and his relationship with Shakespeare has been unusual and fascinating. You went to RADA, you auditioned for Olivier at the National. Was that a key moment? What was that like? Well, no, I, I was in. I didn't. I uh, went to Rada, and then I came to Rada in 1963, and uh, went into regional rep, Leicester and Liverpool, and places like that. And I joined the National Theatre in 1965. I auditioned for Olivia, and uh, he was running the National Theatre then, and he had a, quite a, a powerhouse of people there: Albert Finney, Peter O'Toole had been there, Maggie Smith, uh, um, Colin Blake, a whole bunch of them. So it was a a dynamo of a place, and I was fortunate to be taken in by Olivia and played walk-ons and running on parts and all that. And then I understudied him in Dance of Death, and he gave me a part in Three Sisters, and then I left, not unceremoniously, but uh, he released me to make a film with Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn called Lion and Winter. And I was away from the National Theatre for about two or three years. In 1970, I was invited back by Olivia and John Dexter. And I had a rather troubled career at the National at the time. I, I was a bit, you know, restless. But they, they, they were very generous with me. You got big roles at the National, Coriolanus, yeah. and then the big walkout in, from Macbeth. Oh, yes. My bad years. Why were they bad years? I was a bad boy. I was, uh, I was trouble. I was a rebel. I was discontented. I was angry. And, fed up and hated being part of a, an establishment and hated doing Shakespeare. It was all my own making. I was the enemy within, you know, it was all my own making. It was nobody else's fault. Everyone did their best to, you know, cater to my needs. Were you drinking at that time? Oh, yes, but uh, all actors drink. That was just a, an episode in my life that's over and done with. That's a boring episode was of life. It, but that didn't, I don't think it helped. But I, I just, I was restless, I wanted to get out, and I was, I was frightened, I was, just, I was afraid. I was doing, taking on this monumental part, and I never pretended that, that I had the courage to do these great parts like Macbeth and King Lear. I never said I could do them, I never thought I'd had the courage to do them. It takes a lot of courage to do them, and I didn't have that. I didn't have the sustaining power. I didn't have the discipline to learn verse, and uh, I just couldn't get it. And... Uh, it got from bad to worse, and I think I reached a crisis of nerves. Or I lost my nerve, and I just, one day, I, I walked out because I couldn't, uh, uh, the screaming voice of John Dexter, I, one day I thought, that's it, I'm off. And I got on the bus and left, and I never looked back. Um, I'm not proud of any of that, but I'm glad I did it. I made my amends, I wrote back to Olivia and said, you know, I'm sorry I did that, but I, I had to go. And uh, no regrets, no shame about that, it's over and done with. And uh, but I, I had to do it, otherwise I would have gone mad. I'm 57 years of age and I want to, I want to have the, mo the richest years of my life ahead of me. And I plan to, and I'm going to. I'm not going to waste my time in doing things I don't want to do. You know, I came to terms with the fact that I'm not very good in the theatre. I'm not very good at playing Shakespeare, for example. I admire people who can do it. And I'm glad I've done those parts. I'm glad I've... I don't know if I've been enriched by them. Falstaff I, would be a great role Falstaff, for you. Falstaff? Yeah, too many lines to learn. You know, night after night. No, I, I just love getting on planes and boats and trains, whatever I have to go, and following my dream, whatever that dream is. Did you want to be a great success? Yeah. You well, are a great success. Yes. How has that changed you? It hasn't changed me at all. I've got more confidence in myself. Um, yeah, when I started out, I just wanted to be famous. I, I didn't want to become a great actor. I didn't want to become a great Shakespearean actor. I had no idea. You know, people say, you're the next Olivia. I didn't want to become the next Olivia. I didn't want to stand in wrinkled tights on the old Vic stage for the rest of my life. I had ideas beyond that. Some people would call it arrogant and ambitious. I'm all those things. Um, I'm very ambitious. Um, I don't enjoy Shakespeare, and I'm not good at it, But I, so I'd have to flail around to try and find other interpretations within... When I played King Lear, for example, I played it very badly. But after it took me about 25, I remember 25 performances before I actually started to get a feeling that I was on the right path. I'd started off too high in rehearsal. Um, it was David, David Hare's production, and I'd, start, I'd made a big mistake. I'd started off 
too high on the roof of the part, really. and I had to shim shimmy down the drain pipe of the part to get down to ground level and make him uh, rediscover him. Uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, exhausting when you're doing it in front of an audience. Um, and it's inconvenient for the other actors when you sort of, they don't know what you're going to do next. Despite his aversion to the Bard, Anthony Hopkins would go on to play Titus and eventually return to play King Lear on screen. Big roles, and now the competition for them is more intense than ever. And taking just Hamlet as an example, Today, we can look back on acclaimed performances, not just from male stars, but actors like Maxine Peake, Ruth Nager, Cush Jumbo, and Francis de la Tour. Obviously, I was aware that I was a woman, and this was a man. And I just got that middle ground, I think, where I physically, I was, I was in, I wasn't in doublet and hose, but I was in trousers and a sort of jerkin thing, and, and I had long hair, actually, I didn't even bother to cut it, but I didn't wear any makeup, and, and I used to put my head in a bucket of water before the show, just to sort of be completely clean and cleansed and kind of asexual, in a way. In Shakespeare, those, those, the female, there's no comparison with the female roles, really, and I think women have started going, why can't we want to say those words, we want to speak that language, so I think people have got the confidence now, I think, to sort of go, right, that enough's enough now, we're having a bit of that. To be. Oh, not to be. <laughs> that is a question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. But again, for me, it was about having that experience playing a man, being a woman. I don't think there's any, I don't think the, and I'm sure somebody will tell me I'm wrong, but name me a female part that when she's on the stage, it is all about that part. When you are, you know, I'm not saying the plays, but you know, you are center. You are center of that, of everyone's world, which, because Hamlet is because he's the prince and he's the heir to the throne. So that was a whole, I mean, that's not about the character, I suppose, but that experience, as a woman, to be on that stage and it, you know, it be about you, your journey, was quite e extraordinary. I'm so thrilled now to see women playing Hamlet and I would have loved to have played Hamlet, be only because you want that poetry in your mouth in your, and you want those ideas in your head. That's what you want. You want to experience those ideas and those um, thoughts. It's not so much you want to prance around in tights, but you want to experience, and, and that's the beauty of Shakespeare, is not even the speaking of it, it's the thinking of it, and, and the, uh, the understandings that have to pass through your brain as you're saying the lines. And you want, you want to have that experience. And I used to stand in the wings watching Alan Howard, great actor, playing um, Hamlet when I played Ophelia wanting to experience that myself. Um, Ophelia, which could be a, a wonderful, complicated, interesting role, but there's nothing there, you know, not so tiny. Even when she's on stage, she hardly ever speaks. Um, I'm sure Shakespearean scholars, many of them, will say, oh, no, it's a marvellous role, you know. And certainly the mad scene is lovely. He does, uh, you know, when in doubt, write, write a mad scene for your heroine. So you've got Ophelia coming on, you know, um, and, and then you've got Lady M washing her hands, you know. You've got two fabulous scenes, but, you know, that's not enough. Um, but as I say, it's, it's the wanting to have the, those thoughts, those understandings passing through your mind and, and your interpretation of those, those thoughts. Helen Mirren's view on the inadequacies of even some of Shakespeare's most recognizable female characters have always been shared by others. Are there any parts, Damien, that you, you haven't done because you haven't discovered the truth in them? Yes, I've, uh, because I, I, I've been asked to play Lady Macbeth and, and not so many years ago. And I said, well, I can give a conventional performance of Lady Macbeth, but it won't be a real Lady Macbeth because I don't think the part's fully written. 
Really? No. What's missing? I think the middle bit. The middle bit is missing, you know. She's, she's at the beginning when she's all the things that she says, she do this, that, and the other. And then when she f fails, when she's sort of frightened before the sleepwalking, you don't get, you, you, you don't get, uh, uh, you don't see the run up to it. Yes. You know what I mean, if yes. you think of it like that. It's yes. a very short play, you know. And I think he, he, he got tired of her and got interested. I, I, I wouldn't do it. I said, no, I can't give a performance that I'd like to put my name to, you know, that put my signature to. Yes, yes. And so I wouldn't do it. I'd like to go back a bit. Uh, you came to, to prominence um, many decades ago now. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, what it was like being a woman um, in the theatre in the, the 1950s and 1960s? Well, when I left drama school, when, God, yes, that's getting on for almost 60 years ago now, um, I was told by the then director of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, John Fernald, not to expect to work much before I was 40, because I was essentially a character actress. And that was a very accurate estimate of English theatre at that time. If you look at the larger picture, if you're a man in the theatre in this country, you can, by virtue of the classical canon, I'm thinking of Shakespeare here, go from being a young man at Hamlet to Lear or Prospero in old age. Mm. And there is a role between those two extremes of age which is matched by Shakespeare, which also matches a male development there is absolutely no equivalent mm. for women. Did you really self-consciously want to challenge that kind of, that whole history of how women had been represented? I wish I could sit here and say yes, but honestly, all I cared about was having a job. <laughs> and I, I, it didn't matter where the job came from, what it was. It was essential to work. I mean, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. It's very simple. But I was particularly blessed, I think, and very, very lucky. Luck? No, talent. And later that same year, Glenda Jackson was at the Old Vic stunning audiences with what one critic described as the most powerful portrayal of King Lear they'd ever seen. It won her the 2016 Critics Circle Prize for Best Shakespearean Performance and confirmed that she was one of the finest we'll ever see. As are these. Yes, the dames with whom we began this journey, and where we're ending it too. And we leave you with them contemplating their career ends, and with Judy Dench on the receiving end. Enjoy, and goodbye. Are you all going to work forever? Well, I don't suppose one can, but I'd well, like to. Forever, if I'm asked. If we're asked. If we're asked. What? If we're asked, we're going to work forever if we're asked. Jane. But you're I'll always think. asked first, if I may say so. <laughs> I'm turning on you now. <laughs> it's all coming out now. Oh, one of my hearing aids has gone. What have we just... Do you want one of mine? <laughs> Do you want one of mine? <laughs> I know it will fit. It's just what was the last thing said. Are we going to go on working forever, Joan? Oh, what's that? It? And I said Jude gets all the parts first. Oh, no. yeah, I, well, I tell you, that. my agent in America said to me when, when he knew I couldn't do very much because of the eyesight going, and he said, well, if you do want to come over again, um, we'll look around for a nice little cameo that Judy Dench hasn't got her paws on. <laughs> <laughs> How rude. <laughs>